you didn't touch it the last in the past three months, you're probably not going to touch it in the next three months. If you haven't touched it in six months, you're probably not going to touch it in a year, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it really pays to be a minimalist here, and you have just a few tools. If you have been thinking about taking gardening to the next level, perhaps farming or micro farming, then I think you're really going to like this week of episodes with Ben Hartman, who is the author of The Lean Micro Farm and The Lean Farm. And Ben, I have to say, Jacques on our team is a huge fan. And so he's he's quite jealous that we're chatting today, but but hopefully, you know, he'll be listening to these episodes. So hello, Jacques. Well, Jacques, thank you. And thank you, Kevin, for having me. This is a pleasure to be here. And I love the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Hey, likewise. I mean, we we learn a lot from specifically smaller scale farmers because it's sort of like gardening on uh, steroids, right? Like you actually have to have something come to market. That's how the business works. Instead of us sometimes messing around with plants and maybe being a little bit less rigorous in some of our methods. And so I'm excited yeah. to, to chat with you today. And I think everyone's going to learn a lot. And I kind of want to start with the idea of the lean farm in general, because mm -hmm. it, it is a different twist on on some of the traditional sort of education you hear about urban farming. Uh, the lean production method is really a, a way of doing business that goes back to the Edo period in Japan, if we can back up a couple hundred years. And we have rice farmers um, during this time in Japan that was very, the country was isolated from the rest of the world. So you had kabuki, uh, banruku puppets, uh, origami, paper folding. You had all these quintessentially Japanese things going on during that, that time period. Um, but on farms, something was in interesting was happening. Farmers were becoming much more efficient, and they were reverting back to hand tools. They, uh, because of a growing population, they, couldn't, they didn't have the land to have the oxen um, as a draft animal for agriculture. And so they uh, reverted back to hand tools and became very efficient doing so. And they developed this system of rooting out waste on farms that carried through into well, the first workers at Toyota, Mitsubishi, these other Japanese businesses were these rice farmers, and they had this lean thinking that they brought to the factory floor with them. And so lean is traditionally thought of as a manufacturing practice. It belongs on factories, but it actually originated on farms. And the seven types of waste that are the core, the heart of lean, uh, very much fit hand in glove with, with agriculture too, with, with gardening even. Um, essentially, it amounts to, uh, the way I describe it is it's like a coin. There are two sides to the coin. And Lean says you're either adding value to your product on one side of the coin, or you're contributing muda or waste on the other side of the coin. There's no gray, no, no, no gray area here. Those are tight definitions. And there are seven types of waste, uh, the waste of overproduction, excess motion, and so on and so forth, that the Japanese have delineated. And so applying the Lean system simply amounts to putting on a set of eyeglasses and recognizing when in my garden am I adding value, uh, when am I... Uh, growing crops and getting bigger and better, and when am I just contributing waste or spinning my wheels? That's a fascinating exercise, and as a small farmer, it's allowed us to stay in business. Mm. Yeah, it's it is really interesting because it it sort of reminds me of a lensing that you can just look at the entire practice through, right? Like similar, I in, in some ways, I suppose, to when you learn about permaculture for the first time. And you start seeing the landscape perhaps a little bit differently based on those principles. Obviously, this is a, a different, maybe even complementary approach. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious, like if you could talk us through your farm, Clay Bottom Farm, and how it, you said it kept you in business. So what are some examples where perhaps not using the lean methodology would have put you guys in trouble? I grew up on a corn and soybean farm in Indiana here, a 500 acre farm. And when I was growing up, the, 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 the way of doing business was to get bigger every year. You upsized your tractor, you grew on more land, you rented more land, bigger grain bins, et cetera. And this is what the, the universities were telling us, the extension agents, that to stay in business, you just have to have a growth mindset and get bigger all the time. And so when we started vegetable farming, we started out on a, on a, a one acre patch and then eventually to five acres and we were building one greenhouse new greenhouse every growing season just getting bigger and doing more every year and we were making it but we were working our butts off and burnout was right around the corner and to be honest that to have that pressure to grow and get bigger and do more every year just wasn't working uh it was stressing us out oh. 
it was frankly adding work every season. So we just have the same level of enthusiasm we did in the beginning. So what happened was that uh, one winter afternoon, we got a 40 mile an hour wind that picked up our newest greenhouse. And we just spent all summer building the greenhouse, put all of our investment into it, picked it up and blew it on the top of our barn roof. Oh, man. And what a demoralizing moment. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and we were in the house. My wife, Rachel, uh, heard the thunk on the roof and ran to the window and said, hey, Ben, you better come and check out what's on our roof. And I knew what was on the roof. Uh, and I ran to the fridge, grabbed a couple Heinekens, and <laughs> tried to drown my emotions. Yeah. We sat, sat down and had a <laughs> nice, long, frank conversation that maybe this is a turning point and maybe it's time to go back and get some master's degrees and get real jet jobs. Yeah. Um, so we were kind of contemplating getting out of farming. And what happened was that uh, a few days later, we got a check in the, in the mail from one of our CSA customers, one of our subscription customers. And that check was enough to replace the, the greenhouse. And she wow. said, if you guys quit and go out of business, where am I going to get my food? And here's the cost of another greenhouse, and I hope you keep going. Wow. And uh, at the same time, one of our chefs sent an email to me, basically said the same thing, except he was a, a builder too, and he said, uh, if you guys can fund another greenhouse, I'll come out and I'll help you put it up. And so even as we were thinking about getting out of farming, our community was surrounding us, telling us they want us to keep going. Yeah. And, but if we were going to keep going, we want to do it with a different minds, mindset. One of our, another one of our customers runs a aluminum trailer um, a company, aluminum trailer factory. And he had been using lean in his business for a number of years, sent an email to me and said, Hey, lean is just, uh, turned our business around. And I wonder if some of the ideas or concepts could work on a farm. And he offered to come out and give us some free lean farm training. And that's where it all began. He sat down and coached us on the seven types of waste. We analyzed our business to really understand when are we adding value to our products and when are we contributing to waste. Did some practice called value stream mapping, mm -hmm. um, where we mapped out every step in the process of growing a tomato, for example and then use two colors of sticky notes <laughs> and you do this on a big uh, on a wall and each sticky note denotes a step in the process and we added up when we added value to tomatoes and when we were contributing waste and really it was uh, a, a, just a, an eye-opener to recognize um, that there's so much waste on our farm and if we could cut out the waste we could increase our capacity by so much eh. without having to grow a square inch <laughs> without having to sell one more pound of food, we could turn our business around and become much more profitable. So from that point, we have not actually grown our business, but we've grown more profitable every season mm -hmm. because we've had a less but better mindset. Every, every winter we sit down and ask, how could we do less next year, but do a better job? First of all, it's really cool to hear that a customer just fronted an entire greenhouse when she heard about the, I mean, that's very, what a community, you know, that's really neat. That's right. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about the origins of the lean system and how some of the Japanese farmers were, were going back to hand tools, what were they using prior to that? They were using oxen and they, they couldn't really, they didn't have the space for it. Is that something you, you ended up doing as well? Were you using like sort of more, more fancy, perhaps I guess more wasteful tools, let's say, and you've gone back to more of a hand approach? Not that we're necessarily opposed to technology. Um, it's that a lot of our technology was inappropriately sized for our farm. So we've, we, we, we found better, uh, tools that were more human scaled for our farm. And to be honest, we import these from Japan and Korea. Uh, these are small countries that have never had the option really of growing food. Farmers have never had the option of growing food on t thousands of acres of land like they, they do here. So the best agricultural engineering has always gone into great of farming, small farming and gardening tools in those places. And so we did, we, uh, we're now, uh, a no-till farm, uh, the tractor is parked. Uh, I don't use it on the farm. We, instead we use, uh, tarps for the most part to kill crops and, and battery, some, and electric tools, uh, to use an electric wheel, uh, to do some, uh, uh, some bed preparation and a Japanese paper pot transplanter. I know that one. We can, yeah. I'm happy to dig into the details and all these tools and methods if you'd like. Maybe we could start out with the seven types of waste that are identified in the lean system because 
I actually don't know what they are off the top of my head. Teichi Ono, the, uh, an engineer at Toyota, he developed a list of seven ways that he trained workers on the shop floor at Toyota to look for. These were ways that existed on Japanese rice farms. These rice farmers brought this thinking onto the shop floor. The most insidious waste in farming and in food in general is overproduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you've probably seen the estimates that up to half the food that's produced in this country is not even not ever eaten. And there's waste all along the chain, but certainly on farms and in gardens, uh, we're often overproducing. And so noticing that what I like to say is every seed should turn into cash. Is it? And if it didn't, then waste entered into the flow of work somewhere. And very often it's the case that we just simply didn't align our production with, cu with what customers were wanting. Second type of waste is waiting. This means when did it, when was a crop sitting, not moving uh, closer to the customer? And when were workers standing around or sitting around and not, not adding value to crops? So waiting waste is number two. Uh, the third would be transportation waste. This would mean excess transportation. And certainly on a small farm, you want to have minimum amount of transportation. This is one of, this is a constraint that you can leverage. This is one way that we can be more efficient than our competitors from California and other places far away, selling food here in Indiana. And we're unique in that. One of the things that's unique about our farm is we sell all of our food within a mile and a half of our farm. Is it? And in part, that's to eliminate his transportation as much as we can because we're not uh, making money by driving food uh, for miles and miles but we make money getting into the hands of our customers so we've developed relationships as close to our farm as we can uh fourth way should be over processing so on a small farm business you see this a lot of farmers markets people put fancy labels uh stickers uh we seem to like to wrap our food in plastic in this country country yeah and the reality is a lot of customers are happy just to to grab apples out of a big bushel basket, to uh, grab tomatoes out of an open court. You, they don't need fancy packaging, nor do they want it, if they can, especially if they can see the farmer who grew the food. Next would be waste of uh, motion. And simply put, uh, when are you walking around too much? And hope we'll have time to get to the 5S system tool, tool uh, which is about organizing tools uh, and storing tools to minimize uh, wasted motion on a farm. Next would be a defect. So on a farm, that means the waste of uh, deer entering the garden <laughs> to eat your lettuce, uh, waste that we suffered from last season. From the point at which you seeded the crop to harvest that it became defective is a, is a type of waste. And then um, overburdening, it's my favorite type of waste. A muri would be the Japanese uh, word here. This is a bonus waste. Uh, we're, be, we're beyond the list of original seven here, but overburdening is increasingly looked at as worthy of consideration. What this means is when did people hurt um, themselves during the growing season or when did your tools wear themselves out? When did handles break, uh, uh, engines uh, overused, that sort of thing. And so every winter on our farm, we have what we call a Muri project. And essentially what we do is ask, when did we hurt the most last growing season? Uh, when, what was our, our peak stress point and how could we alleviate that through a project over the winter? Sometimes that's as simple as uh, a few years ago, we bought ourselves a golf cart uh, to move crops around easier. Last winter, oh, nice. uh, to help us uh, do our wheel hoeing. So they can be small projects, but the idea is that every year your farming should get easier to do, not more difficult. Yeah, yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, the one that stuck out to me and I'm kind of curious to dive into, and you mentioned it, was the movement, wasted movement. I think in a gardening context, there's probably quite a bit and maybe it's okay because there's there's no sort of pressure on that hobby. It's sort of what you mm -hmm. want to make of mm -hmm. it. That being said, I mean, for us, tool storage, forgetting tools in different places, having to go hunt it down in the orchard, mm -hmm. this, that, the other is a huge problem for me specifically. I don't know, my brain maybe just isn't really connected in that way. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you guys have done on your farm that has has improved that. Yeah, sure. When our friend Steve, uh, who owns the aluminum trailer uh, company, and he came out and gave us our first coaching sessions, uh, Steve said, hey, Ben, why don't you go prune some tomatoes and I'll just stand back and watch. It was a bit of a trick question. He was doing a little more than watching. He was counting the number of steps I took to prune 100 feet of tomatoes. And I'll tell you what happened is I had to walk 100 steps to their storage shed to grab the pruners, walked another 100 steps back to the greenhouse, and then pruned 100 feet of tomatoes. So 100 feet going to the one end of the greenhouse and another 100 feet coming 
back this direction, so 200 feet to prune the tomatoes. Then I had to walk back to the storage shed to return the pruners. So Steve said, did you realize you took uh, 300 steps to get the pruners and to, and to return the pruners, and you took 200 steps to, act to actually perform the work? Hmm. Okay, does that make yeah. sense? You're already over 100% ratio That's without right. performing the work, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. More than half my steps were non-value adding or muda. And so he said, well, it, well, he would recommend actually taking a stick of dynamite and blowing up the tool storage shed and spread out your tools around the property. Uh -huh. And so now if you come to our farm, you'll see, you'll see magnets and hooks all over the place. And we store, the rule is to store tools at eye level location as close as possible to their points of use. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now those pruners are hanging right inside the greenhouse where we actually use them. And that would be removing at least 200 of those steps, right? If not 300. That's right. That takes out a couple hundred steps. Yeah. What are some other ways? And now you've got me really thinking because we have a tool shed and I've always said, you know, make sure you know, we have some help here is like make sure we bring all the tools back at the very least at the end of the day. And I'm going to, after this, I'm probably going to go outside and <laughs> start doing some experiments. But I'm curious, like other ways you've found as you've internalized that from, from those initial lessons. Another corollary here is the rule of sort. And you want to be a minimalist um, in an effort to save motion. And so we use actually just seven tools on our market farm, which is fewer tools than a lot of home gardeners would use. But the, this is called the 5S system in lean, storing tools at eye level location, but sorting uh, amounts to asking yourself the question, which tools do I frequently touch? Do I frequently use? And if I don't frequently touch or use the tool, then it should be removed from the workspace. So you have to be ruthless about this. It's a bit of a Mari Kondo method. What sparks joy, that's what belongs in your house. For, sure. for lean on farms, it's, well, when did you touch the tool? When did, and these are tools that actually add value to your products. Mm -hmm. And if you're not using the tool or supply, not, if you didn't touch it the last in the past three months, you're probably not going to touch it in the next three months. If you haven't touched it in six months, you're probably not going to touch it in a year, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it really pays to be a minimalist here, and you have just a few tools, and you don't have to do it all in one go. Oh, I realize that's a, that would be a challenge. Um, for us, we took about a uh, full season to really uh, do a deep sort of our supplies, but we got rid of, I want to say, over fi easily over 50% wow. of the tools and supplies, and we really made our farm literally lighter weight much easier to work and walk around and store our, our things. And we uh, spend more time uh, value adding and less time walking around looking for the darn hoe. Yeah. Are, are there tools that you got rid of that you kind of had to cringe? You're like, ah, I really wish I could keep this just because maybe you love the tool, but it had to go. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But the time savings and the satisfaction of having a cleaner, uh, uncluttered workspace uh, easily makes up for having to, uh, we had to, we had a hoe. I got, uh, I wish I'd have kept one of our uh, gooseneck hoes uh, that I had gotten rid of. And we had to, uh, uh, had to eat some humble pie and go purchase another hoe that I had gotten rid of. So there was a bit of that that happened, but the benefits far outweigh the cost. I, I know for me, I have these, I kind of just like tools. And so I, I collect them mm -hmm. like a card collector might. And I have one that's I have citrus shears and they just are made mm -hmm. to harvest citrus. And then I have avocado shears and you're right. Like if I think about mentally going into my shed right now, they're too prominently placed for how often I would use those, which is really almost as a curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously pruning shears can do those jobs just fine. Uh, so I, I'll be, I'll be keeping this in mind and I encourage everyone listening to do the same. Now we turn to spring. In your case, farming is a business. It's something that does have to support you. So you have to be very precise. I'd imagine about how you're planning that out. Uh, so I'm curious, how does that work in the lean methodology for you? Yeah, sure. The way I describe it in the book is that we try to farm like a tree. And one of the things that trees do is they work they work ahead. In fact, they work many seasons ahead. So think about a pecan tree, and it can take 15 years or more before you actually harvest fruit. But in all that time, the tree is, the roots are pulling minerals up from the earth, depositing minerals in the leaves. Those leaves fall on the ground and refertilizes the soil and makes that tree stronger. So that when the tree is actually bearing fruit, then especially when you think of apple trees, peach trees, 
they have this strength to carry the load. And so the way we put that principle in practice on our farm um, is to, we actually do our spring bed preparation uh, in October, November of the year before. So, and we do very early spring planting um, because a lot of, uh, there, are, there are crops that don't require a lot of soil heat. So we can plant myzunas, uh, some uh, spinach, um, Asian greens, uh, and we'll do that as soon as the first thaw hits uh, in late February or early March. And even if the ground freezes up again, if those seeds in the ground, they'll keep growing uh, when the ground thaws again. Um, and carrots is one too. We'll get the first carrot seeds in the ground as soon as the, as soon as it thaws. So that short list of crops, we want to hit the ground running. And the only way to do that is to, to prepare those beds um, the fall ahead of time. It makes a lot of sense. It's, it's interesting for us, at least in, in the climate I'm in, I don't technically have to stop gardening through the winter. And so sometimes mm -hmm. I forget, I guess, that I can just let a bed remain and, and I can prep it, let's say, for that, that coming spring and actually not plant it out with like maybe some brassica crops or some some beets or turnips or something that does well in, in our cold. I've also done just like a, a simple cover crop so that it's mm -hmm. planted, but it's ready uh, to go when, when spring comes. Mm -hmm. How do you think about planting the actual crops themselves? What to actually grow? I'd, I'd imagine maybe at the end of the year, you kind of look back and say, where did we overproduce? Speaking to that, that form of waste. And perhaps, you know, what, what crops didn't work well, maybe speaking to the defect part of that system. So we, have, we use a bed system on our farm, which means that we grow in beds, and ours are 42 inches in width and 75 feet in length. And so what in practice what we'll do is have a big white board, different colors and markers, and we will draw 50 rectangles representing each of the 50 beds on the farm. And this is a great practice to do midwinter and uh, we will map out the farm and we'll have records from previous seasons to know that we put in, for example, eight, eight beds of heritage tomatoes in the previous season. Then we'll look at our sales records. Did we oversell, undersell those? Should we go up to nine beds or should we go down to seven beds next growing season? So we'll make those types of changes, but it's on the bed system. So we basically ask ourselves how many beds of carrots and broccoli and tomatoes and cabbage want to put in this year uh, compared to last season. And then from there, is there anything in the seed starting process that you'll, you've adapted, I suppose, before you, you had the lean methodology? Once we have the beds mapped out with the crops that's going in, we'll, we'll, we'll write next to that crop a seed starting date. Then what we can do is collate all those dates into a spreadsheet and have a seed starting calendar for the farm. This is one of the lean principles we try to apply here. And so when a bed needs to be prepped, we'll put a green, a magnet that's green on one side uh, on this magnetic white board. And that indicates to staff, we have two workers here, that indicates that, hey, we got a bed that's open that needs to be prepped. Okay, and when that bed is, has been prepped, the staff will come in and flip the magnet from a green to a red. On the other side is, is red. And that indicates to everyone that it's ready to plant. And so and it, when you come to our farm, you'll see that board and you'll see, you know, typically five or six green magnets, you know, two or three red magnets. I love the idea. I've seen it on a few farms. I don't know if it's the exact same system, but it's at eye level and it's uh -huh. big. And most of them have some sort of color coded, very bright kind of colored system. Uh -huh. So you can quickly scan, I guess, the board and, and just see what you need to do for that day, right? Mm, that's right. And the idea is to get the farm plan out of my head. Mm -hmm. And if you're a home gardener and you're just yourself working in your home garden, that's one thing. But if, as soon as you involve other people, uh, they want to know what the plan is. And yeah. uh, it makes yeah. work flow more smoothly and involves others more easily. I, you know, it's interesting. I, it's making me think about what we do here, both in the garden and in, in the business, because most of our we're, we're mostly a remote team, except for the folks that work here physically at the garden. Um, and so I think about that in terms of like, how could I design even a Google sheet that we might have to, to be a little bit better. Um, when you get into the actual process of planting out, maybe we get into, I suppose, movement waste or, or something like that. I've always wondered if I'm planting efficiently, I guess. And I think the answer is probably no. 
Uh, I, I'm curious if you guys have found any methods that have worked really well for you. Well, I'll tell you what we did when we started applying lean and we put on the lens of when and trying to notice when did defect wait, when is defect happening most on our farm? It was really within that first three to four weeks of a plant's life, getting seeds to germinate and keeping them alive and healthy in propagation house. The biggest change, we, so we doubled down and said, we're going to make sure every seed germinates. And what we do is we, uh, we built a germination chamber. So instead of using grow mats, the problem with grow mats is they want to desiccate this, the soil. They want to dry out the soil. What a seed wants for germination is humidity, the right temperature, temperature or in the right amount of moisture or humidity around the seed. That's all it needs. It doesn't even need soil. You could, you could germinate seeds suspended in mid, mid air as long as it's humid enough in the right temperature. And so what we did is a neighbor gave us an old chest freeze, freezer. We set it up on end. You could use an old upright refrigerator too. And then went to the Goodwill and found an old crock pot. <laughs> Put that crock pot in the bottom of the chest freezer. Okay. And then we have shelving, uh, some, a rack system uh, in there. And we plug that crock pot into an Inkbird external thermostat. It's a little $30 Amazon device. And they now have a Wi-Fi version of this. And what you do is you, that ink bird tells that crock pot when to turn on and off based on the, your set temperature. Does that make sense? So yep. if, if we yep. want onions to germinate, optimum temperature is going to be about 82 Fahrenheit. I'm doing that right now. <laughs> so it's in my head. Well, uh, on my phone, I'll set the crock pot to 82 Fahrenheit and the crock pot will turn on and I have water in the crock pot and it's get nice and hot and steamy and it stays within one or two degree differential in there. Mm. So we have very precise temperatures uh, always warm and moist and we get near hundred percent germination for about 30 bucks. Yeah. I can beat it. That's, I mean, I'm going to have to, hopefully there's a video I can watch that you've, you've produced on that. Cause that sounds like a fun method to try out. Uh, really creative, really clever. How to make 20,000 from your backyard. I think, and I know when people hear this for the first time, Ben, they just actually don't really think you can do that. Uh, and they don't know how to even begin. Uh, and so maybe we could paint a picture of the possibility. Let me just explain how the math would work for one. Uh, five, let's say you have 5,000 square feet. So the size of many suburban backyards uh, would have that amount of room. And if you can sell just $4 a square foot, then you've reached 20,000. So a head of lettuce at a wholesale market, even in Indiana here, would sell for about $2 a head. You might get 3 or $4 at a farmer's market. A head of lettuce takes a square foot, okay? So if you fill that garden just with head lettuce, and in most places in the U.S., you can easily get two seasons, often three seasons, three rotations of head lettuce. Then with just two, just two crops of head lettuce, the easiest crop there is to produce, um, then you've, you've reached your 20,000. Now, the problem being that hard to find a chef or an account that wants uh, that many heads, 4,000 heads at one time. So you've got to mix it up, a little diversity, uh, throw some tomatoes in there. But the good news is that head lettuces are one of the lowest grossing crops per square foot. Uh, tomatoes, carrots, uh, spinach, a whole host of other crops sell for even higher. And so that's how the math works. If you can simply cut out the waste, have successful crops and find markets, uh, it's actually a very achievable thing to do. Uh, and on our farm, uh, we last this past season, we sold over $5 uh, a square foot. And uh, so our farmers proof that it's possible on a small, small scale, we have just a third of an acre here. So we have 15,000 square feet. Um, but you can, you can sell a high dollar value square foot if you're focused and, and remove the waste. It's, su it's super cool, this, this model, because it kind of gets to the whole transportation waste piece. To me, I get excited about that. I think about that from a gardening perspective, too, of like, there's no transportation if you're growing your own food. And, and consuming it. And that's obviously where, where we focus a lot of our time. But if you're selling, and you mentioned you sell within a mile and a half of your own farm, um, it just seems like it's so beneficial, you know? That's right. That's right. It's, um, uh, it's been incredible because on most vegetable farms, the highest cost are storage, cold storage and transportation. And with a hyper-local farm, micro farming, you, we have actually virtually cut out both of those costs. <laughs> we live so close to our customers, we can harvest and de deliver it to them within a few hours of harvest, uh, eliminate the need for cold storage. And we just spend a few minutes a week on the road delivering our food. So it gives us an edge and it's how we're able to stay in business and compete. 
The first step, however, is to get to know your customers. <laughs> and what I recommend for home gardeners who want to try this, make $20,000 from your backyard, is to print out a couple of what I call value sheets. It's a, simply a sheet of paper and there's three questions on it. Uh, what do you want? When do you want it? How much? Mm -hmm. Okay. So take that sheet into people who are buying food closest in proximity to your farm. I recommend going on a Google Maps and punching cafeterias, uh, high schools, uh, other institutions buying food. Uh, maybe there's a farmer's market, uh, small gro groceries, restaurants, any place where people are buying and eating food <laughs> close to your farm. And especially if you're in an urban suburban area, you'd be surprised how quickly that map fills up. Yeah. And then uh, go around and visit them. And within a day or two, I, I would predict in many areas in, in the U.S., you have a stack of six or eight value sheets, which really are the temp template for a powerful micro farm. Okay, that's your business plan. Yeah. Lean says, start with the customer, work backwards from there. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. And, and instead of, I think this might be a bit outdated advice these days, but you used, used to hear you, you'd have to write a business plan up before you start the business, you go into the bank, you get a loan, this, that, the other. And I've never done it that way personally. Sounds like, you you do an opposite approach as well. You just walk around and see what people want and see if that maps to what you can provide at a at a price that That's makes right. sense for both mm -hmm. of you guys. So you, you gave the head lettuce example as as a simplistic one, but you mentioned you get to five dollars a square foot. Are there crops in your locale that are just dramatically overperform it like maybe a more, more specialty crop? It allows you to get to that five. So what I recommend is crops that you plant once, harvest many times, mm -hmm. okay? So we actually do not grow broccolis, cauliflower, cabbage, uh, potatoes, crops. So you put the seed in the ground one time and you get one harvest, okay? Instead, we're going to grow baby greens, like baby spinach, uh, arugula. We grow a sp spring mix is one of our best selling, selling items. Um, baby kale. Uh, these are crops, put the seed in once, and we use a cut and come again method. My books describe exactly how we do that. But essentially, you put the seed in, you let it grow dense, you put your seed densely like a carpet, and then you harvest on a weekly basis. And we can often get five or more harvests from one seeding. Wow. Uh, tomatoes would be another crop, especially if you have a simple hoop house. Um, even in the north where we're located, we can have a season that's uh, five or six months in length. So again, you put the seed in the ground once and you achieve multiple harvests. Yeah, I remember back when I was doing the microgreens thing, I was watching a few YouTube channels and they were sort of going in that direction, but they weren't quite there yet because this would have been 2014 maybe. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of them were going to like the Hakurai turnips or things mm -hmm. like that. But mm -hmm. even that, I mean, that's not really a cut and come again. That's a plant once and, and remove, mm -hmm. but I guess the 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 per pound price of that was a lot better than let's say some something else. But yeah, no, it's it's really it's really cool to see how this small farm movement has spread over the last, I don't know, decade or so. I mean, I mm -hmm. guess in a couple of years it'll be the tenth anniversary of your first book, right? The Lean Farm. Um, mm -hmm. which to me I think made a big difference in in the whole space in, mm. in general. So okay. So we have a bit of a primer on how you might get started. What would you say um you mentioned you guys are down to about seven tools. Like if someone, what would be the lean setup as far as startup costs and tooling? Um, and again, my book has a list of uh, the tools and supplies that I recommend on season one. And it can be a, it can actually be a fairly minimal investment. You don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars to get it started, but you do need a good set of, the system relies on using tarps to cover the ground to smother crops. And in, and in fact, if you haven't yet tilled or you don't have your garden ready, a good way to begin is to buy a tarp the size of your garden, 5,000 square feet, or might need a couple of tarps to cover that area, that area and kill the turf or kill whatever it is uh, for a couple months. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to rent a center, then rent a tiller and work it up. And then uh, I recommend beginning with four inches of compost. This is called the deep mulch me method. Mm -hmm. I found it to be the best for crops and the best for farm economy too, um, because it's a bit of an investment at the front, at the front end. Uh, but then you have healthy crops for many, many, many growing seasons, and you've got wonderful soil to work with too. 
And so I would recommend uh, calling around, getting a compost truck to come and dump a big load of compost in the backyard, uh, spread that out four inches uh, over your growing surface. Then if you're going to wash your greens, uh, you'll need to have a way of doing that. And I'd recommend uh, simply, you can go to your, t your local hardware store and buy a horse watering trough, a uh, sheep watering trough, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe you got an old bathtub uh, sitting around, but you need a large place that you can get a lot of water into to dunk your greens uh, for washing them. And then I'd recommend a restaurant-grade solid spinner, uh, the Webstrand store, uh, excuse me, webstrandstore.com uh, would, would sell an entry-level version that works very nicely for small farms. If you're handy, then grab an old washing machine, cut the top off, and put it on permanent spin cycle. Yeah, uh, we've got a couple of these in our farm, and then you can again use a horse watering basket um, to uh, set in there, drill a bunch of holes in it, and then after you wash your lettuce or your spinach, you can put it in that basket and spin the moisture off. And that's how we sell, grow, and sell about a hundred pounds a week, uh, baby greens using that that very method. Um, fairly simple to to set that up. The one I've seen the most, I suppose, and with farms in San Diego, some of my friends, a lot of them are on the washing machine system, mm -hmm. mostly because mm -hmm. they can grab or use an old one and then do a conversion, and mm -hmm. you know it's pretty pretty inexpensive to get that that system going. When, when we talk about like the more businessy side of it, you know, the, 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 the planning of, of what to grow, the customer service or the del delivery or sort of the customer management side. Is there anything someone would need to know when they get started? So you want to use what in lean they call a pool system. Okay. And so instead of growing a random crops, random amounts of crops, you grow precisely what customers said they wanted when they wanted it. And to the extent possible in the precise amounts. Okay. And so I talked in a couple of essays ago about using value sheets to collect that information from your customers. And then as the season progresses on a weekly basis, uh, contact your chefs or your uh, restaurant, your hospitals or whoever's buying your food and present a, what we call a fresh list. Mm -hmm. uh, let them know what you have available on your farm, the amounts and the price. And we simply use Google sheets, and our, our chefs like to re reply by text. Okay. And so I, I simply take a picture of the Google sheet and send that picture to them in a text <laughs> and they can, they can reply and let me know what they want. So that weekly point of contact with your, with your buyer is pretty important and staying in close contact with them. It's actually been the key to the success on our farm. Pricing is important too. Of course, that first season, you're going to need to figure out well, how much to charge. What I recommend is to charge what the market price is for the item that you're producing and you're organic you're local you probably have a higher quality fresher certainly fresher products so you can be on the high end of what local organic prices are selling for and most of your chefs and people you might sell to are happy to let you know what they're paying for uh baby spinach or tomatoes from other suppliers that they have so if you can match their price they're often happy to uh, to pay what they're currently paying because they know you're going to have a better product. At this point, do you price above market because you know the products better and, you, and, and you've built some trust with customers or do you still keep it sort of right around market just to move product? Sure. I and mean, that's an open conversation yeah. uh, that we have. And uh, certainly these last couple of years with price inflation, we've had to adjust our prices uh, last year, actually three times throughout through the growing season. Mm -hmm. But just staying in contact with the buyer and asking them, hey, would this price work for, for you? Um, this is what we need. We'd like to pay our workers, you know, living wage prices here. Yeah. And I'll tell them this is what we need to, you know, make those living wage prices. Will that work for you? Yeah. Um, but just open communication um, has been key. Uh, don't try to hide your prices or change them without letting people know. Uh, just stay open about pricing and what you need to make a living wage. Makes sense. Any final thoughts you would give someone who wants to make 20000 from their backyard? Like may maybe words of encouragement or, or things to watch out for? Well, first of all, you can do it. <laughs> um, anyone can put a seed in the ground. Don't be intimidated. Uh, and it, it's so much fun to do. It's the most rewarding job that, that you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. Even if you just do it part-time. Uh, in Japan, they have this half farmer, half X movement. Uh, where it's ex the idea is that you farm part time and then you work in a dentist office or a musician or do you run a bed and breakfast something else the other 
uh, for the other part of your career. It's a it's a great way to connect yourself to the earth, to stay yeah. grounded. Second bit of advice would buy yourself a small hoop house. Yeah. Sure. Um, nowadays, there are uh, affordable starter kits all over the internet. Uh, get yourself a little 10 or 12 foot wide hoop house. If you're in the north, it's I joke that it's like a, it's like a free trip to Florida every winter. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, farming <laughs> and greenhouse. So have fun with it too. It's a awesome. great, uh, yeah, it's no, a great some, practice. Some amazing suggestions and, and thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom. If people want to grab uh, your books, uh, what else you're up to, they want to connect, where can they do that? There's lots of inf free information on claybottomfarm.com. Uh, uh, that's our farm's website. And uh, we describe our growing systems on that website and there are events on there too. Every season we have a two day lean farm startup workshop, uh, limited to 20 participants. And that's coming up uh, first weekend in May this year. We have a few slots left uh, for that uh, two day workshop. And a lot of people have come to that workshop, uh, gone back home and started successful farms that they're still running. Uh, today. So I hope you can make it and, and check out the other resources on the website. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much for coming on, Ben. It's been really cool talking to you. Hey, well, thanks. It's, it's been nice being here. Mm -hmm.